why don't I get us started? Um, so everyone today, it's my pleasure to welcome Karan Singh, who did his PhD at, in computer science at Princeton, working with Alad Hazan, and who's now a postdoc at Microsoft Research, who's going to tell us all sorts of things about boosting. Take it away, Karan. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Karan. And uh, so I'll just quickly introduce myself and then get into the, the topic, which is boosting for online convex optimization. So the arrows are there just to make sure that you read it in the correct order. But even if you read it as convex online optimization, that's completely fine. Uh, so right. So I'm a uh, Technically, I haven't received my PhD at Princeton. Oh. I'm receiving it this January uh, <laughs> because I forgot to submit my thesis in time to the to the manuscript library and so on. Uh, but yeah, like I'm currently a postdoc at Microsoft Research. Uh, so just to give you a quick uh, flavor of the problems I work on, uh, for the last few years, I've been trying to develop some sort of understanding of an algorithmic framework for or an algorithmic foundation for control theory versus what is typically an analytic foundation. So stuff where you can write down what's the co correct control law, the correct way to behave versus somehow implicitly describing it through algorithms. And uh, on this, my advisor Elad and I gave a joint tutorial at ICML. Uh, I care about predictions in dynamical systems where you have long-term correlations, uh, where sort of IID-ness doesn't help you learn very quickly. But sort of the defining characteristic of my book is that almost all of it is through the lens of online learning or optimization. Although none of my works are purely on optimization, but the, this way of viewing things through the optimization lens is, is pervasive. And, but today I'm going to talk about something different than either control or prediction. Although it has ties into both and I'll mention them as I go along. So here is what I want to do in this talk. I'll give you the broader context uh, or the motivation. And this is going to be super speculative, so I apologize in advance. Then I'm going to tell you what is the concrete problem that we are solving in this paper. I'm going to tell you the main result. I'll tell you what and how existing, how existing boosting algorithms work and why they, do, why they don't necessarily work for the problem that we are trying to solve. And then I'll tell you how to fix them so as to make everything work. So the last three points, I'm hoping to give you a constructive sense of what the proposed algorithm in this work is, rather than a description of the algorithm straight up. And I'm hoping that somehow is more satisfying. So here is uh, the really speculative part of the talk. So the speculative part is that uh, we know that there's uh, a reproducibility crisis in science and social sciences too, actually. So here is, here are some of the news articles in media concerning this on the left. And uh, there has been this thing where people report that they have been unable to confirm their own experiments, their, the experiments that they carried out in the past. And in fields like psychology, I think there was uh, this sort of beyond just having people being surveyed and opinions being collected, there was this thing where uh, there, there were uh, directed efforts at trying to reproduce uh, uh, earlier studies. And they found out that about 50% of the studies were not statistically significant. So things that were declared to be statistically significant were not. And it's not just about being at the five first, like five, uh, like P being 0 0.05. It's also the case that the mean size was, the effect size was effectively half. Uh, and there's a sort of similar movement going on in machine learning if you follow the uh, major conferences in the sense that there's a consistent sense that it serves, uh, that often people do not did not, at least in the past, release code for the papers. This number was something like 20%. And now the increasing awareness, I think at least uh, people submit, like uh, the ac accepted papers at NeurIPS, for example, have about you can find about 70% of the times that there's associated code with it. And, uh, and to me personally, as a personal note, it seems like reproducibility in machine learning, at least the kind of machine learning that we do, should be super easy. We work in environments where the data is fixed. So that's supervised learning, even in something like reinforcement learning, uh, there are very few papers that actually go out in the real world and collect data. 
it's most uh, mostly sandboxed. There are simulators, and there's no good reason why we shouldn't have reproducibility in these, these environments beyond considerations such as uh, like in this, uh, intellectual property and so on. Uh, but here is the thing that I think even reproducibility does not solve, which is does reproducibility or replication translate to utility? And there are pretty terrifying examples of this not happening in machine learning. So, and in some sense, this is the norm versus uh, the, the exception in the sense that uh, at machine learning conferences such as ICML and Europe's, there are uh, about, I think I, I, I quickly did a random sample to calculate this. There are at, so at least 90% of the papers uh, make a, some sort of claim on the advancement of the algorithm. So these, these are not papers about lower bounds. These are not papers about theory. They, these are papers that suggest algorithms and they, and they explicitly say that these algorithms perform better in certain environments. And the kind of translation rate that we have for these things in practice is super low. So there are examples, for example, in reinforcement learning, where uh, there, there are uh, algorithms that work very well on simulators, uh, but they don't translate to real life robotics, uh, uh, real life robotic advancements. There are cases where you, in model-based reinforcement learning, there's a notion of a model and a notion of a uh, planning, um, planning oracle that optimizes for the policy on that given model. If you somehow, if sometimes it, it's the case that if you switch out uh, the model learning component, the thing that learns about the environment and learns how the environment behaves to something that does better in a maximum likelihood sense, that leads to an aggregate loss in performance of the result in policy. There are cases in architecture search where if you somehow also include uh, optimization hyperparameters in your architecture search, not, as, not just is the list of architectures that you come up with very different than uh, sort of the rank list of architecture that you come with is it uh, not, not only is that very different, but also the sort of internal, the, the implicit rankings between architecture search algorithms themselves sort of changes once you include this parameter, uh, this space of parameters in your uh, architecture search problem. There are cases in NLP where, uh, again, uh, the choice of optimizers. Uh, changes the uh, notion or the implicit capacity of the models, of the predictive models. So all of this to say that replication does not imply utility. And I, I would argue the reason these things happen is that the algorithms that we propose are somehow very fragile. They work for the experimental setup that the paper considered, but not necessarily uh, anything beyond uh, that. Uh, beyond an epsilon ball uh, out of the uh, the context in which they were stated. So this somehow over the last few months I've been, so this is sort of a side project for me, but I think this is something that at least some effort should be invested on, which is can we come up with a systems level way uh, of thinking about machine learning? So can you come up with somehow a theory which says, look, if there are individual components in a learning algorithm, I can precisely say, uh, if you improve this component, what's the resultant uh, change in the system performance? Of How does the aggregate change as a function of individual components? And this is something that people have in traditional fields of engineering. So I deal with a lot of control algorithms. Uh, and in control, there's a very nice way of breaking down uh, sort of robotic or manipulation environments, manipulation tasks into individual pieces. And they have a precise sense of, uh, if I improve this bit by a certain percentage, what happens to the aggregate system? And even in machine learning, I would argue that this is already the case that this happens, but we somehow don't address this at the correct level of abstraction. So here's an example. Uh, let's say there uh, are uh, features and labels. So Features are X and labels are Y. This is the standard supervised learning setup. And we are trying to regress Y on the output of some learning algorithm applied to X and plus the output of some other learning algorithm applied to X. And even if X and Y are IID, so the standard supervised learning setup, what happens is because there are two algorithms uh, running in parallel, this essentially leads to non-stationarity for both of the algorithms. Because the effective sort of residual that 
E1 is trying to regress against is Y minus E2 applied to X, the state of E2 applied to X, because both of them are, of course, algorithms, so they have a notion of internal state. And typically in, the, in machine learning, non-stationarity would be something that you would be afraid of. But uh, I would argue that here, non-stationarity is the thing that helps you to learn. So, uh, and we don't have a way of systems level thinking of sort of like trying to resolve this problem. So for example, here's a non-solution. Uh, here's something that I would argue is a non-solution to the problem. So for example, if A1 and A2 were neural nets, then I could write down the entire state matrix, so the internal weights of the neural net and of A1 and that of A2, concatenate them together and write out the sort of system, uh, the evolution of this weight vectors of A1 and A2 over time. And that would probably tell me that A1 and A2 learn together better than having A1 or just A2. But this, I would, this, my entire argument in this talk is sort of resolving the question at the wrong level of, of abstraction. We are trying to understand what happens inside the algorithms to figure out what, how they behave together. And the thing that I want in, uh, out of this line of work is to somehow come up with a characterization of aggregate performance in terms of the functional behavior uh, of, uh, of, comp of the internal components, not necessarily uh, the exact details in which uh, they behave, but rather some sort of like, if I have a performance guarantee of some sort on each algorithm A1 and A2, can I, can I come up with some sort of performance guarantee on the on this sum? So this is, uh, so the sum here is, is kind of a trivial example where we can actually do such things. But uh, in general, like this is the kind of systems level way of looking at machine learning that I'm trying to move towards, which is, uh, can you come up with sort of aggregate uh, indicators of performance of the total system based on some sort of functional characterization of A1 and A2 rather than their, their, their own internal behavior? Question. Yes. Is there any particular reason you write uh, it in this way, A1 of X plus A2 of X? Why not just write it in, as A3 of X? Yes, so this is exactly what the, the thing that I was trying to point to. So it's possible to view like the sum of two neural nets as being an, as, as a neural net. And then because you know the internal algorithm that works on neural net, for example, like backprop or stochastic gradient descent, you could uh, write out the entire set of parameter vector of the neural net A3 as, a, as, as, as the quantity that you're trying to analyze and write out the dynamics for that explicitly. Uh, that is feasible. But that I think is the, uh, sort of the correct solution at the wrong level of abstraction for these problems. Because uh, that somehow doesn't tell you if I switch out the optimizers for one of these components, what happens? So somehow I think the correct thing to aim for, so this is very speculative. So this is very open for discussion too. The correct level of uh, sort of uh, coarseness or granularity to aim for is that a, if you know that A1 has a certain, for example, performance guarantee and A2 has a certain performance guarantee. Can you come with the performance guarantee on the aggregate algorithm? Mm, thank you. It feels like you're getting at what I think it was like one of the, um, sorry, not I. Yep. People who know much more than I think of is one of the great problems with the mysteries around deep learning. I mean, you know, you set it up as an optimization problem, but suddenly we know that uh, how well you generalize it depends a lot on what optimizer you use. Yeah. And so, you know, and some people realize it means that really we're not solving an optimization problem or we don't know the right optimization problem yet. Right, 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 right. right. Other strange yes. things. So like that doesn't, and even getting into that issue, we can just go with like one learner and we have the yeah. same nightmare. So I think, so right. So I'm trying to somehow advocate for a top-down view where we define sort of what kind of uh, input output characteristics do we want over individual subnetworks? and then try to algorithmically solve for that. Rather than, I think currently deep learning theory is mostly descriptive. There are algorithms that work and people try to describe what they do rather than trying to solve the inverse problem. Yes. Uh, yeah. So that was for the speculative part. Now we can get into details. And uh, uh, this work is a very small section of the systems level theory. And I don't have the systems level theory yet. 
so yeah, so that's, but that was the motivation. So here is boosting. Boosting is a framework that does this for some, some uh, system architectures. So boosting, one way to view it is that it's a computational way of breaking down problems. It's a computational way to do compositional learning. And in boosting, typically one wants to aggregate weak learning algorithms into strong learners. So aggregation means that the inputs to the boosting algorithms are weak learning algorithms. And then the weak learning al algorithm outputs strong learners. So weak learning algorithms are weak in the sense that they're inaccurate. They're slightly better than random. They could be from a very simple function class. Uh, and the strong learning algorithms, the things that we want to produce are super accurate and expressive. And the reason we are willing to tolerate uh, sort of like aggregation of these weak learners into strong learners is th the idea that weak learning is somehow computationally cheap. So the, the boosting methodology only makes sense if the weak learning oracles are computationally cheap. You can quickly construct inaccurate simple learners. Uh, so here is the story of boosting as I understand it. So there's the so-called classical boosting theory, which is uh, which is something that came out of theoretical computer science from Rob Shapiro, you are fluent. It was posed originally as a question, if you can somehow learn some things non-trivially better than learning it to epsilon accuracy. So it was a negative result, but often people use it as, as a positive algorithm. Uh, uh, so here was the definition of weak learning for classical boosting. So given algorithms that do slightly better than random, can you somehow learn or learn to do as good as the best hypotheses in some hypotheses class? And the aim here is to clearly enhance the accuracy of the learning algorithms, accuracy of the base learning algorithms. And then there's, uh, so this is what classical CS theory, for example, pointed out, that this it's possible to do and it's possible to do efficiently. There's this uh, parallel line of work uh, called gradient boosting, which is pretty old. And some of the classical boosting algorithms have connections to gradient boosting. But in gradient boosting, the object, the input to the uh, boosting algorithm is a learning algorithm that is as good as the best hypotheses in the hypotheses class. And then it outputs something that is as good as the best hypotheses in the convex hull of the hypotheses class or the span of the hypotheses class. So in this way, gradient boosting, the primary objective is to enhance the expressivity of the uh, boosting algorithm. It somehow competes with a larger class than the, than the weak learners themselves. And so the, the, these still seem somehow like complementary in the sense that gradient boosting doesn't necessarily accept weak learners that are slightly better than random. It needs something that's as good as the best hypothesis in some class. And classical boosting theory uh, does as good as the best hypotheses in the hypotheses class, not the convex hull of the hypotheses class. And there's a good reason for that. So the good reason for that is that classical boosting theory, as far as I know, has only been studied for linear loss functions. So functions that are linear in the prediction and the label, uh, or at least the prediction, just, just the prediction. So, and the reason for that is uh, that, uh, so if you take up uh, examples of like binary classification where the underlying set is essentially negative one or one. So a segment between negative one and one or multi-class classification where your decision set is the simplex uh, or multi-label where your decision set is the cube or rankings where the decision set is a permuter hydride. The loss functions in all these cases is just like some linear function of your decision. And for linear loss functions, this distinction between the hypothesis class and the convex hull of the hypothesis class makes no difference because the extremas for linear functions are always at the vertices of polytopes. So here is the thing that we do in this talk, which is we give a unified algorithm that uh, somehow enhances the accuracy and the expressivity at the same time. So it achieves both of these objectives. It works for convex loss functions, which is why the expressivity question is even meaningful. And it works for arbitrary convex decision sets. So somehow for classical boosting, it was the case that 
each of these results. So making, so the original other boost algorithm, the classical boosting algorithm was posed for binary classification and extending these to multi-class, multi-label and rankings, each of these required a special construction and a different paper. Uh, so one of the things that we do here is to give a unified algorithm that doesn't really care too much about your decision set. Uh, and that construction I hope will be become like super clear at the end. So that's the objective in this talk. I see that there's a question that I could address. So do we worry about how many weak learners should we be working with to get a strong learner? It's, it's completely an issue. Right, so th this is a good question. Uh, uh, so right, so the objective here would be to use as few weak learning algorithms uh, uh, together to convert them into a strong learner. Uh, so th and the hope is uh, the original boosting statement was this was polynomial and people over time improved it a bit and we'll get something that's actually tight. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. No problem. Thanks for the question. So here is the concrete setup uh, uh, where I describe what the weak learning and the strong learning algorithms are. Uh, and the protocol is the standard online learning protocol. So we observe some context or feature vector CT we make a decision by choosing some point xt at all points in time inside my convex decision set. And I suffer some loss function, which is ft of xt. Uh, so I'll introduce this slightly ugly notation. And I'm sorry about that, which is f with bracket square uh, with uh, triangular brackets is the average value of f over my convex decision set. Uh, and this mu, the, the measure I integrated with respect to is arbitrary. It's typically the case people want it to be uniformly random. So this is the average cost that a random decision suffers uh, on the function f. So right, so here is the definition of weak learning. So, a weak learning algorithm is any algorithm loss functions. So ct, ft, tilde. Uh, ensures that the weak learner's loss, which is the quantity on the left. So uh, this quantity. So the loss of the weak learners interpolates the loss of the best hypotheses in the hypothesis class and that of a random decision. And this gamma is precisely the edge uh, the weak learning algorithm has over a random decision. So for example, if gamma was zero, this is as good as the uh, random decision. So in boosting, you typically want gamma to be positive, at least slightly greater than zero. And I've included the quantity R W here, and that's there because uh, to essentially accommodate the internal generalization error of the learning algorithm. So this will be a quantity which uh, also decides how accurate the strong learning algorithm can be. And the typical expectation is that the internal weak, uh, the regret of the weak learning algorithm is sublinear in the number of examples that it sees. Okay, so that was the definition of a weak learner. A strong learner is something whose performance, whose aggregate cost is as good as the best hypothesis in the, hypothes in the convex hull of the hypothesis class up to some regret term. And the game here would be to control this regret term uh, as Siddharth said, in terms of how many weak learners that we use and RW, which is the internal regret of the weak learner. So just to summarize, here is the distinction between a weak learner and a strong learner. A weak learner is slightly better than random. It has this uh, edge gamma. A strong learner is, is one competitive with the hypothesis class. But it's even stronger in the sense that a weak learner competes against uh, the hypothesis, uh, some hypothesis class, and the strong learner competes against the convex hull of the same hypothesis class. So it's a larger uh, class. It's also the case that the uh, that the weak learner can accept linear loss functions, and the strong learner can accept any convex loss function. So it's it's more general in that sense. Uh, right. I can take questions now for the setting because I think we'll fix the setting for the rest of the talk. Okay, I can proceed hopefully. So right, so that was the problem definition. I'll tell you the main result and then we can quickly move on to what and how boosting algorithms work. 
So the main result that I have is with my advisor. This appeared at ICML 2021. My advisor is a lot. And we give a bunch of more results on how this works in the statistical case to the, the, the statement is more precise in the paper, obviously, uh, how it works for bandits, et cetera. But here's the main result. There is, an, uh, uh, there is a boosting algorithm, an efficient boosting algorithm that makes use of n weak learners and guarantees that the regret is t over gamma square root n plus the internal regret of the weak learner over gamma. It can be shown that both of these quantities are tight and they're like, so the first part is required, the second part is required and that they're required together. So this is a tight bound up to constants, of course. Uh, so here is the implication of, of such a result. And before pointing out the implication, let me say that the computational burden of this algorithm scales, it scales linearly with n. So that's the cost you pay for uh, using a higher value of n, more weak loaners. So by computational burden, I mean the running time would scale with n. If you have a single processor, if you have n processors, it would be a constant. So it's the straight off where you have more processors, it can be parallelized. Uh, so let's see what the implication is. So the implication is that learning can happen. The other way of view it, uh, viewing it is that the net regret of the boosting algorithm is sublinear, as long as you use a super constant number of weak learners, and as long as the weak learners generalize. So, which is to say that RW itself, the internal regret of the weak learner itself is vanishing or sublinear. So that is the main result. Uh, and now here is the very brief summary of what we do. And then I'll move to quickly describing how boosting algorithms work uh, and why they don't work for this objective and how to fix them. So the, the rough summary here is this. So there's this uh, question of when you aggregate weak, different weak learning algorithms, you, these algorithms themselves have state inside them, a notion of memory. And somehow so you must provide them some notion of feedback for every decision that they make. And the sort of central distinction or the uh, uh, distinction between our algorithm and the, and the previously proposed algorithms is uh, in what uh, feedback that do we provide these weak learners. So gradient boosting is called gradient boosting because the feedback that you provide to the weak learners is effectively the gradient of the residual loss. So if you have summed up 10 uh, weak learners so far, the cost of the 11th week learner is like y minus the prediction of the first 10 week learners, the gradient at that point of the loss. And the realization here that we have is that this kind of feedback is insufficient to incorporate this random gamma edge in gradient boosting. So we'll do some augmentation to the loss to make sure that we can somehow still deal with approximate week learners. So let me quickly get into uh, how existing uh, boosting algorithms work. And to, to say how they work, let me, uh, in fact, describe something simpler, which I think is going to be pretty popular in this group because uh, a lot of people work on it, uh, which is the conditional gradient or the Frank-Wolf algorithm. So in the, it's, a, it's a setting where that does not even involve learning. It's a pure optimization question where you would try to, you, where you want to minimize some convex function over some convex decision set. And the conditional Frank Wolf algorithm, the conditional gradient algorithm, which is some form of greedy coordinate descent, is just the following algorithm that you start with some point, you calculate the negative gradient at that point, and then choose a pivot, which is effectively a D point in, the, uh, in your uh, convex decision set that maximizes correlation with the negative gradient. You go a bit in the direction of that pivot from your current point, and then you reiterate. That's it. So it always maintains sparse combinations of vertices or your, of your convex set. So in T steps, it will maintain like a T sparse combination. And uh, the guarantee associated with the conditional Frank Wolf procedure, this is literally the simplest, the most vanilla form of Frank Wolf, is that the function values of optimality you suffer due to this procedure scales as one over n for smooth functions. So if you run this algorithm for n time steps, you see the function value suboptimality as one over n. Uh, 
Good. So let me also quickly point out that if instead of somehow minimizing correlations with the gradient or maximize correlation with negative gradients, if you could do this only up to some delta accuracy, then you would suffer additionally plus delta. And that's not a big deal, but this is how uh, gradient boosting algorithms work too. So I'll, I'll just point out quickly that in the next, next slide. So here is the uh, a very simple way to view gradient boosting as some sort of front post. So the algorithm is that we see a context vector CT, a feature vector CT. We choose an arbitrary decision. We then take convex combinations of n different weak learners. So this is the uh, convex combination. And then we play the thing that comes out at the end by taking iterative convex combinations. So now I must somehow penalize my weak learners if they made the wrong decision. So that penalization is this linear loss function. I just take the gradient of ft, which is the current loss, at the point which is xt and minus one. So this is all the decisions except that which the nth weak learner suggested. Uh, and here is the uh, here is the inter interesting part. So let me just quickly yeah. Uh, the interesting part is that this is effectively Rankle in some hidden form. It's basically a form of what I like to call amortized Rankle. It's not true that for any single time step that we are making the optimal decision for, uh, uh, from, a, from the weak loneliness perspective. But it's true that across T time steps, RW is the maximum error I'm making in comparison to the best decision. And as a consequence, this sort of amortized Frankfurt view immediately gives you the same kind of guarantee that we had on the last slide. It tells you that the regret of the strong learner, this boosting algorithm, is RW, which is this delta factor that's lost in, in the, arg, the arg maximization, times uh, plus one over n, which is the number of weak learners that you use. And this is not a contribution of our work. This is gradient boosting has been long been known, and this analysis too. And this specific analysis comes from a paper due to Bagel, Zimmer, Kale, and Luo uh, that appeared at NeurIPS. But yeah, like you could uh, use any of the other boosting. The, the choice of the specific boosting algorithm that I specify here is not super important to the talk. So good. So now let me tell you why uh, this algorithm by itself doesn't work if you have gamma approximator, if you have something that's only slightly better than random. Uh, so of course, to accommodate these approximate oracles, I need to change the algorithm a bit. So let me describe the most natural change and why that doesn't test, that doesn't give uh, an immediate solution to the problem. So let's do this trick that simplifies the problem description a bit. Let's just make sure that the centroid of the decision set with respect to this random measure, it's, it's at zero. So if that's the case, we know that the cost of a random decision on a linear loss function is zero by linearity of expectation. Uh, and if th that is true, so this is a simple algorithmic change that we can do inside the algorithm, which is compute uh, the centroid of the decision set and use that as the origin inside. Like every time you make an affine update, just make sure that that is taken care of. So if that's true, then the weak learners as we define in this current setup uh, are look very similar to the thing that we had for gradient boosting except that there's a gamma factor in front of in front of the uh, uh, the learning guarantee which is the uh, the cost of the best uh, hypothesis in your hypothesis class so remember that there was this also this one minus gamma times the uh, cost of a random decision but that's been taken care of because we made sure that that quantity is zero by this coordinate transformation or rather coordinate translation. Uh, and now what we would like is uh, the same thing that we had for uh, gradient boosting, which is effectively we would like to compete with the convex hull of the uh, hypothesis class. So this looks very tempting. So, you know, like the first thing that came to my mind after I looked, I, I stayed this, uh, at this for minutes is there's this gamma uh, here. And what I could do is divide this entire equation by gamma. So here I would get a RW over gamma, this gamma would vanish. And because of linearity, I could basically say that the weak learners, they simply output XT over gamma. 
right? And then this becomes exactly the gradient boosting pr problem. So if the weak learners output instead of xt, xt over gamma, they compete with the best hypotheses in the hypotheses class up to a suboptimality, which is rw over gamma. Uh, and that immediately gives you a regret, which is rw over gamma, the suboptimality of the weak learner times one over gamma square n. And this is some sort of diameter term that gets lost by due to the scaling of the iterates. So the algorithm now is very simple. The change that we made is instead of including whatever the weak learner suggested in the convex combination, we are including the weak learner over gamma. And that's it. Uh, so here is a question for the audience. What is wrong with this description? Like, why doesn't this solve the problem? So this looks to me, my first fear when you put this eta over gamma is it looks like over relaxation, which yes. typically is not stable. Yeah. In no, so it's stable in the sense that you're still taking convex combinations of one over gamma times the decision set. Uh, so it's stable, but it's problematic. And you're correct, like this is an over relaxation. So that's exactly the problem. Uh, so the problem is that, as Dan said, which is we are taking convex combinations of rescaled versions of the decision set. And this, if you think about in terms of the settings that people originally suggested boosting first for something like binary classification or multi-class classification, it makes no sense. What does it mean to play a probability distribution that does not sum to one? Uh, uh, or technically, because we centered the decision set, it still sums to one, but which is negative. Uh, so this is a good algebraic trick, uh, as I view it, but this does not solve the problem. Uh, because these you cannot play these as probability distributions. Um, so here is the thing that does solve the problem. And it's a very simple trick built on top of this entire procedure. So let's just review for a bit what happened so far. Uh, so, so far we know that if we uh, do this sort of weird boosting procedure that does not even output points correctly, we get something that has regret RW over gamma plus one over gamma square n. But the cost of doing this is that the points that it outputs are not necessarily inside my decision set. Sorry, give me a moment. I'm really sorry about the call. <sighs> Sorry about the call. So here is the uh, here is something that you could just hope is true, which is what if instead of giving uh, instead of just passing on the loss function that I received to the boosting algorithm, I somehow modify it. Uh, so there's this operator mod which takes in a function and spits out a function, and so th so that is the modification of ft being converted to ft tilde and then somehow if i if the if this weird boosting procedure gives me a point xt xt tilde which is not inside my decision set i'll somehow compute a function which projects this onto my decision set uh, so xt and if while doing this i could ensure that the quantity here which is the true regret is less than the quantity on the top, then I would be done. Because we know that this is already somewhat reasonable. It's bounded by something that is tight. Uh, although it does not make sense because XTs are not inside the decision set. XT tildes are not inside the decision set. But if I could somehow, on the true loss functions, play points inside the decision set and guarantee that the regret is strictly smaller than this fictional quantity, then I would be great. So let's just try to argue what kind of properties would we want from the projection step and the modifier of the loss function. So my claim is that you essentially want two properties and the third I'll mention what we want. So the two properties that you would want is that the modified loss function. So this is the first wish here and the true loss function. They agree everywhere inside your decision set. Uh, and why do we want it? Because xt star, uh, if this is true, then these two terms are equal. The things that we're subtracting out are equal. Uh, 
uh, because XT star, the comparator is always in my, in my decision set. The second thing that we want is that if I consider the modified loss function, then projecting always helps, which is to say that whenever I project for all modified loss functions, I simultaneously decrease the value. If this were true, then uh, this, if the second condition were true, then the, uh, then the uh, quantity here would be less than ft tilde xt tilde, because this is precisely the thing that says, look, on the loss function ft projection helped. Uh, on the modified loss function ft tilde projection helped. So these are the two conditions that we want. And then you want this condition that if you start out with a convex loss function, you end up with a convex loss function because your optimization procedure works for convex loss functions. You want that if you start from a Lipschitz function, then you end up at a, with a Lipschitz function. So this construction has to be reasonable enough. But this, these are the two, two properties. To summarize, we want that that the function and the modify uh, and its modification agree on the decision set. So that is this statement here. And then we want that the act of projection always decreases the modified loss value. That's it. Those are the two things that we want. Uh, and here is effectively the last slide, which is that this is very easy to satisfy. Uh, so here is the wish list on top. Uh, and before going into the construction, let me say that there's a Tolstoyan element to it. So Tolstoyan in the sense that all successful boosting algorithms like Adaboost work the same way. They work for a specific decision set, but they satisfy these uh, things in, uh, somehow implicitly. It's not super obvious how they satisfy this, but there is a formulation of Adaboost that, for example, does this. Uh, so here is the modified loss. So if you take a function f, simply add g, which is the Lipschitz constant of that function, times the distance to the, to the set as the augmented loss function. That's, that's the augmentation. Just g times the distance being added to the original loss. And the projection, in fact, can just be the usual projection, which is consider the point, which is the closest point in your decision set to any point, uh, to the point x. Now, let me quickly tell you why. So just as a graphical representation, like here's what uh, the loss, the augmentation. So G times the distance to the decision set, set looks like. So it's zero inside the, the decision set. And then it sort of like grows linearly outside the decision set. Uh, so, so right. So, and it's clear that this is convex because the distance to a convex decision set is convex. It's Lipschitz enough. It's like twice the Lipschitz constants of the original function. So that's also reasonable. Uh, right, so let me tell you why the first property is true. And that's true because the distance of a point to uh, inside a decision set to the decision set itself is zero. Uh, so the first property is satisfied that F and modified F agree on the, on, on the convex set. And here is the proof for why the second property is true, which is just uh, these two lines here. So if you look at the modified loss value at uh, x, so this is the right-hand side here. So it is f of x times g times the distance, negative f of the projection, right? So f of projection is precisely the, the left-hand side here. Uh, so if you do this, just by the Lipschitz property of the loss function, this is g times x minus the projection of x minus distance. But x minus the distance, the size of x minus projection of x is precisely the distance to the set. So this is always negative. Um, and that, that's, that's the proof that all you need to do is somehow add some sort of value outside the set to make sure that it's always profitable to play points when you project. And that's good enough to achieve both of these objectives together. So the last kink that I didn't iron out is to say that gradient boosting, all of these guarantees that I told you are held at one over or T over N kind of rates, but for smooth loss functions. And uh, this sort of construction is necessarily not smooth because L2 square is smooth, but L2, the distance itself is not smooth, like as, as the construction for the illustration, for example, shows. So you need to somehow smooth the function. 
And because of smoothing, you end up losing T over uh, a factor of square root n. And there are various ways of smoothing the function. If you do it, if you want to do it computationally very, very cheaply by random sampling, you lose a factor of dimension. If you do it by essentially like some sort of like convex envelope uh, that I write down in the bottom, uh, this inf convolution kind of operation, you do not lose a factor of dimension, but the projection operator, the, uh, the smoothing operator is slightly more, it's still polynomial time uh, tractable, but it's slightly more complicated to construct. But yeah, this is the entire construction. So here is the uh, reason I like this result. There were individual results for trying to do boosting for decision sets, like even if you forget the gradient boosting objective. And this result somehow says, what properties do I need from the decision set to be able to boost inside the decision set? The answer is basically nothing. All you need is your set is convex and that's more than good enough. Uh, so thank you, that's the conclusion of my talk. I could take any questions. I could also clarify any point. Thank you. Well, why don't I start with a question, which Sounds is good. if you had a somewhat complicated loss function, maybe implicitly defined or something, and you didn't know the Lipschitz constant, do you have a way of addressing that? Uh, yes. So. Technically, the Lipschitz, the Lipschitz constant that we need is, uh, so, okay, so, I mean, we need to be able to compute the derivative of that loss function to uh, the okay. finite differencing, right. but you only need like a local Lipschitz constant. It's not the global Lipschitz constant, but it might be not easy to uh, calculate as, as you rightly point out. Okay, so, but you're saying, but if we have like, if we can do, um, if we can compute the loss function and its derivatives, and maybe something nice about a neighborhood. You uh, know, so we have code and we can do some automatic differentiation or something, we might. Yes, yes. Or yeah. even just finite differencing, as long as you get like deterministic estimates of the function, that's that's also fine because then you can just do manual differencing to compute the gradient. Okay. Let's see. Is anyone else going to pop in with questions? Well, if not, um, let me just say thank you very much for a very clear, well-delivered talk. So thank you. thanks again. <laughs>